want to find out what's going on in your community, El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. I'm Siwa Pili Rose Amador Lebeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. Today we have with us Tom Phillips. Welcome, Tom. Welcome. Thank you. And back to the show. You've been on once before, but it's been quite a few years since we've seen you. It's been a while. It been has while. been, huh? So why don't we start off, tell us about your tribe. I'm uh, from the Kiowa tribe, Koyga, Gekombe Koyga. And uh, the Kiowa people are probably one of the most nomadic uh, uh, tribe among all of the tribes, among the Plains tribes particularly, and uh, uh, migrated uh, from what is uh, British Columbia, southern Canada, all the way uh, through the uh, Plains, northern Plains, and through the Colorado Rockies, the Black Hills, all the way into their present location in southwestern Oklahoma. Ah, okay. um, their journey began at uh, uh, Contact, 1492, uh, in, in Canada, what is now Canada. Mm -hmm. and settled in Oklahoma in the 1850s. Ah, now you're out here on relocation. Your family came out on relocation? I came out uh, individually mm -hmm. on relocation, a federal government program back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was relocated from my home uh, community of Anadarko, Oklahoma uh, in August of 1962. Pretty much been out here ever since that time. Can you explain to our audience what it is? A lot of people aren't familiar with the term relocation. Sure. Relocation was a federal government uh, uh, employment assistance program that was implemented in the uh, mid 1950s under various uh, result of various studies on the impoverishment of reservation communities and. Um, uh, just the um, quality of life on reservations and the government's effort to improve the quality of life set up federal uh, subsistence assistance programs for Native American families, American Indian families and individuals um, to move them to um, uh, major metropolitan areas such as San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles, Denver, Dallas, Cleveland, mm -hmm you name it, the larger cities, Seattle. So uh, I, I came to San Francisco. My first choice was to relocate to Dallas, which would have been about 200 miles closer to home. Uh -huh. But uh, there was an availability. I had originally um, wanted to apply for um, a vocational training program as a uh, laboratory technician. Mm -hmm. uh, that program was not gonna be available for about 90, more, 90 days longer. Uh, there was a program available here in California, Northern California. It was through the maritime um, uh, programs, uh, uh, the uh, National Maritime Association, the Sailors Union of Pacific, the Marine Cooks and Stewards uh, program, uh, mm -hmm. unions, San Francisco. And uh, it was a training program in uh, near Calistoga, California, uh, north, mm -hmm. uh, northeast of Santa Rosa. And it's a retirement home for seamen, uh, merchant seamen. And uh, the training program was to train um, individuals that wanted to work on uh, steamships uh, to work in the hotel service mm -hmm. as room stewards, as waiters, as cooks, uh, bakers uh, in, in that field. So I went to that program um, and became a, um, a uh, merchant marine, merchant seaman. And I was involved in that for about 10 years. And uh, so the relocation brought a lot of families. 
there was a kind of a first, a minor wave of relocation during the war, during World War uh, II, uh, to Bethlehem Steel and some of the uh, shipyards here in, in Northern California uh -huh. uh, in Los Angeles. And um, so the first wave was not uh, subsidized. There were more individual family movements. Uh -huh. uh, but the relocation program was a subsidy program and the federal government, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had uh, offered subsistence uh, to individuals. They paid uh, room and board in um, While you were going board, to school. Yeah, well, going to going school and then a subsistence, a, a living allowance. and. So I came to California on that program. What there impact was, do you think that had? It, it had quite an impact. Uh -huh. um, it was responsible for um, just the movement into the uh, into the major metropolitan areas, mm -hmm. um, doubling, sometimes tripling the native existing native populations mm -hmm. with the relocation program. But the impact that relocation had, it uh, gave us an opportunity to, to grieve and to um, have grievance. Uh, about our conditions, the plight of our Indians, and that manifested on Alcatraz Island, the mm -hmm. occupation of Alcatraz Island in 1969. So we came together as Native people at San Francisco State University, University of California, Los Angeles, and in our communities as well. Mm -hmm. We began, uh, when Indians, Native American Indians began to move out in relocation program, we first initially congregated at bars and pubs and uh, nightclubs and things like that mm -hmm. uh, because there wasn't uh, a center or there wasn't a place for our people to gather. Later on there were centers that began to evolve uh, the uh, intertribal friendship house in Oakland, mm -hmm. the San Francisco friendship house, the San Francisco American Indian Center, San Jose Indian Center and so they began to develop as a result of relocation. Mm -hmm. The impact it, it did have was again it gave us an opportunity to come together and to express ourselves, to meet uh, in collectively in those centers and uh, just to have town hall meetings, to get togethers. And out of that also came an opportunity to exchange our cultures. We came from different communities and different environments and different tribal, different cultures, and, and we brought those all together. Mm -hmm. And we began to socialize. We began to uh, create uh, uh, cultural gatherings, now called powwows. Back then we called them dances. Mm -hmm. And we would come together and we would share songs and We'd set up our drums and sing, and we had some people from the Northern Plains. We'd take turns, the Northern people would sing their songs, the Southern Plains people would sing theirs, and we all integrated, we all danced together and, uh, and engaged in, 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 in just uh, being connected. And so the relocation program uh, impacted uh, the way we lived in our environment in urban communities. And as I said, it gave us a chance to come together and it, um, offered our young people a voice um, in, uh, in, in the plight of our people by expressing that uh, this, this uh, satisfaction with the conditions of our Indian people on with the occupation of Alcatraz Island and later other occupations, uh -huh. Fort Lawton and uh, Wounded Knee and other, uh, other places as well, Gallup and Bureau of Indian Affairs in, in Washington, D.C. So it gave us uh, that, uh, that opportunity that and it connected uh, se sequentially with the civil rights movement right, uh, right. that was taking place throughout the, throughout the nation. And then later on, the uh, objection to Vietnam, the, 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 the war efforts and the protests. And, uh, and so the relocation program impacted uh, our Indian communities. A lot of our elders began to believe that it also created a, a, a brain drain by that taking the bright minds off the reservation and relocating them uh, into urban communities. And uh, there was a fear that they might not return and they, they, they might not be, be, become a, a part of the community again. So there was that concern that many of our communities and leadership had on the reservation. So California is kind of the melting pot because it, it, it has all the different tribes in, it, in addition to the California tribes. Right. So you just have a, a mix of Native people. And I think a lot of people on the outside don't realize that they're, the tribes aren't all the same. They're we all are different. Not. They We're have different languages, they have different dances, they have different cultures. And it, it is a melting pot here in California. And California has um, one-fifth of the total population of all the reservations in, in the country. Uh, there are 110 uh, existing tribal governments in the state of California. Uh, there are 560 some 
um, Indian tribes that are recognized right. by the federal government. So there's one fifth of them are located right here in California. And it is, it is a very diverse state. Um, and it's also unique to uh, itself, the autonomy of California, because uh, in historical uh, transitions when, uh, when uh, California was a part of Mexico and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo mm -hmm. Uh, and the transfer of responsibility of the native people to the state of California. That didn't happen. The United States, I mean, California did not uh, uh, embrace the, the conditions of the, of the treaty as they should right. have. And so, the, the, consequently, the land was stolen, wasn't paid for uh, in the state of California. Um, with our tribe, we had fought and we resisted settlement. Uh, with the uh, railroads coming through our reservation, our, it wasn't even a reservation, our homeland, mm -hmm. our hunting grounds. We resisted very, um, very vigilantly to protect our homeland. Um, by the time it reached the West Coast, um, there, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of displacement that took place. And with the gold rush in the 1850s and um, uh, other events of history, that took place just nearly all but decimated our culture. Absolutely. So we saw that relocation gave an opportunity to us to revive and to renew um, our intent as, as human beings on Mother Earth. Do you think there's been a reemergence of the identity with culture? Very much so, very much so. I think that many of our tribes and tribal communities have realized that that we're just one generation away from losing our language and our culture. And so hopefully we're able to survive and sustain um, our indig indigenous identity through our language and culture. Uh, I am married to a non-tribal member, a non-Kiowa member. My wife is from the Wallapai tribe and Navajo. Uh, my dad was from Muscogee Creek, but I was culturally raised as Kiowa. So I understand my language, I speak my language, and I'm teaching my children my language and their cultural identity. Uh, not only of the Kiowa, but I'm teaching their identity of the Muscogee, the Navajo, and the Wallapai as well, so that they will know who they are, they will have that identity. It's been my experience that those children that have uh, their identity intact have, um, have, uh, have a special, unique uh, place in our, in our community. And those individuals that are from that are culturally intact have um, they don't have that ad adapt um, that difficulty adapting. Um, they stay in school. Mm -hmm. They graduate. They go on they have self to get esteem. yeah. They have self they esteem. They so they have stability in the home. They right. know their identity, and that's what our culture can provide. And, and through venues such as powwows and cultural mm -hmm. gatherings and. Um, so that is kind of the glue that holds our community together. Absolutely. And we can maintain the balance of, of what, what is important to us. Now, earlier we were talking a little bit about cultural competency and social services, and let's talk a little bit about that. I um, have been a social worker from the 1970s all the way, I just recently retired this past June. Uh, was on faculty at California State University Stanislaus in Turlock in the Masters of Social Work program. And so I've always been a social worker mm -hmm. uh, in our tribes. It comes from our tribes because we've always had uh, systems of care within our tribal structure. We've always had people that had responsibilities, roles and responsibilities to take care of the orphans, take care of the widows, to take mm -hmm. care of the homeless, to take care of uh, those ill, and take care of those that have special needs. So we always had our systems of care intact. When the government and the people began to develop and, and create the United States of America, many of our systems were lost because we were displaced from our homeland and from our culture. And we were forced onto reservations and uh, we no longer had those roles and responsibilities identified and maintained and, 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 and revived and sustained. So consequently, there was a lot of um, I don't want to say the dysfunction, but there was a lot of uh, confusion in our development over the years and in our, in our history. So social work has been important to me because it has been a, a part of our system to care that I've always associated with. Education is another part. My mother was a school teacher. My <clears throat> stepfather, who raised me as a father, uh, was also worked with the children, uh, the, the students that were absent or that uh, uh, needed some 
-hmm. kind of attendance um, concern, concern mm -hmm. uh, and uh, attention. And so my parents were both educators. They worked in the education program. Consequently, I, I was evolved into the field of education. Uh, I have uh, three of my sisters and two of my brothers uh, that are also in education. I have a younger brother who's the uh, uh, principal of one of the um, largest schools in Oklahoma City um, in high schools. And so uh, it's always been a part of our family mm -hmm. uh, family system and, 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 and a prerogative that we need to, to maintain, not only providing um, care, care for our community, but also uh, making sure that education is a part of our, uh, of our way of life. Very necessary. Now, do you think that the uh, sis the governmental systems, whether it be counties, cities, are really addressing the um, cu cultural sensitivity issues? I, I kind of I think they've gotten away from a lot of it, mm -hmm. where before they used to address the needs uh, better as far as even hire the people they hired, and it seems like they've gotten away from that. They have, and, and there've been historical. Um, uh, systems or levels that have that have perpetuated that and when we talk about bilingual education we're not talking about native language and mm -hmm. and English we're talking about other languages right. and English so we don't so we kind of live in an exclusive an exclusive uh, system that excludes some of our people in particular our native people because there's a historical past that America does not want to remember and so when it comes to cultural competency when it comes to equity when it comes to parity when it comes to um, uh, teachers and, and social workers and uh, people within the systems of care uh, not being rigorously trained on how to effectively uh, uh, work within mm -hmm. a, a culture, a community, um, it, it seems that um, Native people are often uh, excluded from that process. When we talk about cultural competency, we, we're talking about refugee populations, mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, immigrant populations, but we're not talking about native population, we're not talking about native Absolutely. people. Yeah. And that, that, you know, that also goes for the foster care system. Right. You know, and I, I see these systems really getting away from, well, I, I guess it boils down to white people saying you have to do this or this is the way it should be done and this is what's best for you instead of having our own people say what's best for us, you know, because they know what's best for us just through um, generations, you know. And, and again, it gets back to that historical development of this country where we have lived under that paternalistic society that continues to treat us as children and not consider that we had values that were intact long before the settlement right. of this country. We had systems of care that were intact long before the settlement of this country. And yet that system does not allow us to <clears throat> maintain our children in, uh, in the uh, environment that they need to be in. Uh, even the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, many of our uh, children are removed from their homes and they're placed in non-native homes and that continues today. There's a lawsuit against the, the uh, state of South Dakota right now because that system, even though the Indian Child Welfare Act exists, a federal program which has precedent over the state laws, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, in compliance. And so that extends all the way to California. Back in the 1980s, California was about 65% compliant, in compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act. So 35% of the cases were out of compliance. Mm -hmm. That's a big number That's when it comes to our number. children. Uh, and so we don't have systems of care that are culturally sensitive to our children when they're in the foster care system. They don't have that. Uh, they may, the, the foster parents may agree to a case plan that includes uh, cultural participation. They may take them to a movie. Uh, they may um, uh, take them to a powwow but it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. It goes to understanding their identity, Absolutely. their point of, their place of origin, their point of origin, who they are, mm -hmm. what they're about. Studies have indicated, have shown that Indian children that were raised in non-native homes, non-Indian homes, have a propensity to commit suicide because there is that loss of identity. Mm -hmm. They're not connected with their origin. And so they're lost, and they and 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 um, so social 
services and foster care systems need to be aware of that. That is imperative and very important for our children to maintain a cultural identity. Absolutely, because we even see the dropout rates getting higher instead of getting better. Sure. And you know, it, the jobs that were available before are not now. Everything is highly skilled. Mm -hmm. So unless our kids get an education, they're going to be left behind. Exactly. And that's what we're seeing. What we also see within the systems of care, and I've noticed that in my years, over the years, in, in, in practicing in social services, mm -hmm. that there has been a dramatic uh, impact of 9-11. Uh, with post 9-11, those systems of care have been reluctant to engage in cultural competency, uh, identifying needs that are culturally sensitive and appropriate, but denying them because of the fear that, uh, that the minority community may take over, that there might be an influx and in, in, in a change in the system that we're, we're a country and a nation that's used to the status quo. We don't want to change anything. We particularly don't want to change it if it's going to impact our community and our society uh, for, again, with 9-11. So we don't want to treat any minorities with special attention or special care. With the young man that was, that was uh, killed in, in Missouri. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the police department still maintained that, that, uh, that uh, mentality of post 9-11 that everybody's the enemy that's darker than me. Everybody's my enemy and poses a threat to me. Right, right. And, and so, I mean, there's just so much out of whack. But, you know, our, our grandmothers and grandfathers uh, told us that we were going to be out of balance in our society once man walked on the moon. They said, that's going to disrupt the harmony and balance of what we have here. And that is what is happening. That's a foretelling of the prophecies of the old ones. They, they knew there was going to be imbalance. There's going to be problems with our rivers. There's going to be problems with pollution. There's going to be problems with society. Um, mayhem and and that's coming to be that's coming it certainly coming to has be. look at the yeah. weather I mean it's yeah. just it, everything's out of balance everything's out of whack mm -hmm. it's 100 degrees in Portland Oregon yeah. it usually rains there you yeah. know and I, I can't help but think that recently in the news there has been this woman who's been going to all these airports and going through security and my first thought is the reason she hasn't been caught is because she's a white she looks like a white middle class woman. Okay, she, I think she is homeless, but if you look at her, she looks like... She's not know, a threat. No. She's not a threat. She's grandma. If it was us, exactly, yeah. we would have been stopped, exactly. you know, and frisked and everything else. And, but because she is white, she... Nobody doesn't raise... She didn't fit the description. No, yeah. no. And that's so true. Mm -hmm. You know, you see someone being pulled over, and if it's a person of color, there's several cop cars there because they're afraid of yeah. that person. That's and we basically still the bottom to have line they're afraid of. Profiling not only in the highways but in the schools, in education, in, 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 in society. There's still that racial profiling. Absolutely. Yeah. So Tom, what are you doing now? You're retired, so you're I well, bet you're still keeping very busy. <laughs> I am. I, I haven't been able to really enjoy retirement kicking back and just relaxing, but uh, I've got several books that I'm working on. Good. And, uh, also doing some consulting with some of the agencies, mm -hmm. uh, providing culturally sensitive kind of material. I do a, 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 a men's group in a substance abuse treatment program called Red Road. And it's uh, substance treatment, not necessarily substance treatment, but certainly uh, uh, sharing with those that are part of the residential treatment program that we had our own way of life uh, before, um, before this became the United States of America. As I said, we always had systems of care. And, and, and with traditional ways, traditional values. So what I, I, I share with the groups is that we need to get back to the traditional teachings. We need to mentor ourselves in one of the roles and responsibilities of the male, roles and responsibilities of the female, the way they were before systems changed all of that, yeah. before uh, this became the United States of America. We, we forget that we had a way of life and values that were intact, uh, that were in place. and. Uh, so I, I share with the, the group uh, that it's important that we, that we maintain that balance in our, and, and that's one of the reasons that we're out of balance. That's one of the reasons that we have substance abuse is that we have been, become displaced because of the evolving of the, and change in the nation and, and what has taken place over in our own history. 
That's wonderful. And when you write these books, you have to bring them on the show because, you know, we are, we are seriously lacking that reality, that homeland, that connection. I see that with our, I work with, you know, social service kind of program. We work with a lot of kids that have issues, you know, and they, they really need that identity. We work with adults, we work with, you know, a lot of people that when you bring it to them in a cultural sensitive way, they can relate to it. Mm -hmm. But it's not the traditional way that it's being presented right, you know, right now. And, and it's unfortunate because as, as Indian people, as Native people, you know, we've always practiced from a spiritual plane. Uh, all of our culture and identity has been from a, not a religious. A lot of people mistake that. Religion right. is not spirituality. Spirituality is innate. It's within us. Uh, religion is something we learn, something that we learn and we ritualize. Um, so all of our Native people have a spiritual practice that's a part of them. And, and so we can reconnect with that then we can maintain some balance and, and it's holistic and it's, um, and, and it's very purposeful, you know, that, that we need to pay attention to that because we have those uh, scientists and those uh, psychologists and psychiatrists that are uh, adapting to the native practice and labeling it within their own framework. Um, and so we've always practiced dream interpretation We've always uh, practiced. You know uh, what, Tom? I'm going to bring you back to talk about every one of these things yeah. because we're out of time. <laughs> okay. But you, you're just a wealth of knowledge, and I'd like to bring you to Santa Clara County so we could uh, incorporate some of your uh, your programs. Thank you for being here. Well, thank here. you very I'm much. Sorry to cut you off, That's but all right. we're out of time. That's okay. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Good night.